Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Phil Stinson from the Department of Classics, and it is my pleasure this afternoon to introduce Dr. Amanda Gailey as the first speaker in this fall's uh, Hall Center Digital Humanities Seminar Series. We have four speakers planned for this fall, and we will have an additional four speakers in the spring semester. And uh, I'll say a few things about uh, Dr. Gailey. Uh, Amanda Gailey is an assistant professor in the Department of English at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln, where she specializes in uh, 19th century American literature and digital editing. Amanda co-edits an archive of children's literature called The Tar Baby and the Tomahawk, which is online, of course. And this archive traces depictions of racial difference in 19th century and early 20th century children's literature. She also co-edits the journal Scholarly Editing, which is a born digital journal uh, that publishes digital editions. And she has also contributed to uh, the Walt Whitman Archive and the Spencer Archive. Um, Dr. Gailey has also published several articles on digital editing um, on Whitman and also on Dickinson. Uh, she has a book coming out soon uh, from the University of Michigan Press called uh, the, the Proof of oh, sorry, Proofs of Genius: uh, Collected Editions from the American <laughs> Revolution to the digital age. Uh, the title of her talk this afternoon is The Case for Close Textual Attention in the Age of Text Glut. Please welcome Dr. Amanda Gailey. for coming out. I know it's um, nice and warm outside, so I appreciate everybody walking over. Today I'm going to talk about close textual attention in an age of information overload. What happens to the humanist tradition of close reading in the digital age? It faces threats and opportunities within the digital communities. I'm going to begin by talking about threats to close reading and why it's worth preserving. And then I'm going to discuss how courses on digital editing can be an effective way of teaching close reading in an age of text glut, how to sip from a fire hose, to paraphrase Jerry McGann. In the beginning of Wall-E, we see the robot, here we go, I'll mute it going through the waste left by mankind on an abandoned earth, compressing and stacking small cubes of garbage and occasionally pulling out a found treasure, a hubcap, a cooler, a Rubik's cube, or a VHS tape that seems worth salvaging. The movie, of course, is making a point about environmentally irresponsible consumerism, but Wally also provides a metaphor for the intellectual labor that we are increasingly valuing. The rise of Web 2.0 has been accompanied by a rise of discovery labor, cultural work that centrally involves locating, digesting, and sharing interesting content. Popular sites such as Reddit and Buzzfeed are based on discovery labor. Many memes and other content shared on social media have anonymous creators, but the sites have built-in structures and etiquette for crediting those who discovered or first shared it. The appreciation for discovery and fil filtration seems to be a reaction to information overload. We are exposed to almost constant information, the scope and pace of which is overwhelming to us as individuals. It is unsurprising then that what we increasingly value is labor that filters that information for us and directs us to easily digestible nuggets, simplifying the disorienting flow of information. Many of us recognize that this shift in valuing discovery labor comes at a price. It significantly contributes to an oversimplification of complex problems that warrant extended and complex professional analysis. And it invites us to join cultural tribes seeking information distillation sources that confirm our biases. I provide this larger context for how we're responding to information overload 
because it mirrors trends occurring in digital humanities and portends problems and opportunities for text studies. In the last several years, humanity scholarship has tried to rapidly evolve to address the unprecedented quantity of materials now available to us. I think I have some numbers here. The Internet Archive offers 3 million volumes. Hadi Trust has scanned 11 million volumes. Google Books, 30 million volumes, and plans to scan all 130 million unique books in the world. Even relatively small mass digitization projects such as Write American Fiction, which collects all fiction published in the US between 1851 and 1875, includes 2,800 volumes, which would take a single reader several years to read if she read them full time. In the face of such numbers, the intense, laborious textual attention of traditional text studies and editorial methods sometimes seem hopelessly naive. Why should we spend time and money focusing such close textual attention on this or that text when millions more are waiting in the wings? The concentrated attention on individual texts has been famously dismissed as quixotic and pointless, anecdotal, as Franco Moretti has called it, by some digital humanities practitioners who prefer methods designed for analyzing large corpora. To warrant special focused treatment, texts need to stand out as particularly important. Consequently, canonical texts continue to draw editorial attention, while other texts seem more suited to methods that treat them as part of an undifferentiated mass, a kind of historical hive mind. Canonical texts need little justification for focused editorial attention. If for no other reason, they're important by virtue of having long been important. This extends to minor texts by canonical authors. I haven't tried this one yet, but I plan to. <laughs> so letters, journals, juvenile writings, and jottings all seem to warrant close textual attention if they can help shed light on the canonical mind. This is not necessarily bad. These materials can be revelatory to scholars and to lay readers. However, what seems to be emerging is a landscape of digital literature containing two disparate classes of texts and authors, those whose canonicity was fixed in or before the golden age of scholarly editing, that is, the early Cold War, before the sexual revolution and civil rights movement prompted literary scholars to reconsider canonicity, and long before even later challenges to the canon by post-colonialism and queer studies. And everyone else, on the other hand, including both schlock and potentially revelatory materials. Long established canonical figures buoyed by foundational scholarship and editorial attention that predates political and ethical challenges to the canon continue to be gravitational centers for editorial labor and focused textual attention in the digital age, while most everyone else is packed into steerage. Dramatically different digital methodologies suggest themselves for these classes of texts. While canonical texts receive the careful attention that has long defined scholarly editing, the glut of other texts seem to demand methodologies that can account for their vastness. Text mining or gross reading methodologies, predicated on treating literature as big data, seem to be de rigueur for works whose number requires us to consider them from a great height. With gross reading, we need not justify anecdotal reading, there's no need to select representative or exemplary works for scrutiny when we can consider them all. This analysis holds the seductive promise of making objective, verifiable, replicable observations about the entirety of literature that bring literary research out of the naive realm of the qualitative and into the world of the quantitative, which is what the digital zeitgeist, based on a core belief in better living through data analysis, is everywhere telling us is a superior approach. As my colleague Matt Jockers has written, big data render close reading totally inappropriate as a method of studying literary history. However, the bird's eye view of literary history for all of its claims to objectivity and comprehensiveness rests fundamentally on a data set and methodologies that contain flaws and lacuna that to my mind, it has never adequately answered for. I'm going to summarize what I see as basic shortcomings of the big data approach to the study of texts 
in order to show that it is not clearly the only or best answer to how to approach text studies in the digital age. I think that understanding the shortcomings of gross reading better equips us to justify our work and to think creatively about new directions for the long-held humanist values of close reading and focused textual attention. First, despite its claims to comprehensiveness, big data literary study has gaps in its data set, the extent and importance of which are unknown. Proponents have gone so far as to argue that we can now study literature in its entirety, that when we pose questions to databases of texts, we are actually studying all of what was written in a given time period, and therefore can make conclusive claims about literary history. But even if Hadi Trust or Google Books scans every unique book in every research library, we are only getting what a series of people have found fit to curate. It's easy to imagine disposable lowbrow texts or locally published and distributed materials that would have eluded preservation by institutions that saw their job as curating what was worthwhile. We know, for example, that libraries have often removed advertising from bound periodicals to save shelf space for important content, much to the chagrin of later scholars who are quite interested in advertising as documentation of the cultural imagination. In my own work on race issues in 19th century children's literature, I have found tragic absences in the curatorial record. For example, the very first periodicals ever created expressly for black children were Amelia Johnson's The Joy and the Ivy um, in 1887 and 1888, and they are both now seemingly lost to the tides of history. How many such texts published on the margins of institutionally affirmed culture are missing from the supposedly comprehensive record of big data? Today's digital record is inherited largely from the curatorial decisions of the past and bears the legacy of the socio-political omissions of previous decades and centuries. To gloss over these omissions by overstating the comprehensiveness of the digital record is to unreflectively affirm the dubious ethical and political postures of institutions. Another complication in big data treatments of literature is that the methodologies flatten all works as though they were equal contributors to the cultural record. <clears throat> a database of thousands or millions of works treats each of them as a single unique instance. Not only does this bulldoze the complex publication records in varied forms of some works, but it also fails to account for vast disparities in the cultural reach of different texts. For example, to compare two now canonical texts, Moby Dick sold just over 3,000 copies in Melville's lifetime, whereas Uncle Tom's <coughs> Cabin sold 300,000 copies in its first year of publication in novel form. In a big data view of 19th century American novels, each of these books would typically count as equal, despite one having sold more than 100 times the number of copies of the other. To be fair, this is not an easy problem for big data theorists to solve. The sales figures for most novels are missing or incomplete. Um, but it's important to note that objective seeming graphs and charts of 19th century fiction are depicting a cultural landscape that is as divorced from the messy realities of material existence as, say, the idealized texts of mid-century critical editions. And even if we had perfect access to sales figures, many books were published and purchased as much for the conspicuous display of good taste as for the actual content of the texts. Uncut pages are so commonplace that we know that book sales do not perfectly translate to book reading. Databases also oversimplify geographical complexity by conflating all regional literary marketplace, marketplaces into a singular national one. Some books were only regionally circulated. In fact, this regionalism was occasionally violently enforced, as when book agents selling abolitionist texts were run out of southern towns. A database that is not sensitive to regional differences, and frankly, I don't know how it could be, falsely suggests a homogenous availability of texts that flattens the complexities of political influence, transportation difficulties, and regional interests. I'd also argue that something similar happens in how big data treats textual chronology, usually 
presenting a picture of literary history that graphs original publication dates, suggesting that the publication year was the most significant moment in a work's lifespan, when in fact some works had long reaches and might have been more widely read or available sometime after their first appearance on the market. Moby Dick, whose literary value only became widely appreciated decades after its first publication, is a prime example of such a work. Even if a database had access to truly all texts, could weigh them according to sales or reading figures, was geographically sensitive, and could account for a lifespan on the market rather than just the moment of birth, it would still neglect a key cognitive component to reading. As readers, we don't approach all texts equally. Sometimes we read them antagonistically, sometimes sympathetically. Sometimes we read them as trashy, guilty pleasures we soon forget. Sometimes we read them with our listening ears on, deliberately receptive to their points of view and arguments. Big data methods simply cannot account for these many complexities of texts, um, contexts, and readings. They offer quantitative measures of a data set that is incomplete and that flattens so many of the factors influencing a text's cultural importance that, to my mind, we ought to see their utility as real but quite limited rather than heralding them as the new best way to study literature. But the most significant weakness of a bird's eye view of textuality, I have a silly cartoon that I thought was funny that I came across, but, um, is that it fails to account sometimes for a text's individual humanity. And I'm reminded of the scene in The Third Man when Holly Martins confronts Harry Lyme for fraud that had caused many deaths. The two men are standing on a Ferris wheel, and Lyme looks down at the park goers below and says, look down there, would you really feel any pity if one of those dots stopped moving forever? From a great height, we can see sort of the expanse of the crowd, but we fail to see individuals as people, their particular contexts and stories and individuating characteristics, sacrificing those qualities for breadth. Distance reading bears this relationship to close reading. We need close analysis to appreciate and represent the individual features and importance of a text rather than approaching text databases as a historical hive mind. I think then that close reading traditions within the study of literature, such as careful editing or considerations of material histories have a pretty solid position when held up against gross reading. Gross reading has some weaknesses that are frequently elided by digital humanities advocates. And these weaknesses can lead to unwarranted faith in their objectivity. The numbers often don't mean what they seem to mean. So I think that in the face of a digital humanities community that places a premium on gross reading and associated tools, textual scholars should feel empowered to assert a continuing central place for more familiar scholarly. On the other hand, to stay viable in an age of text glut, digital editing really needs to also make use of the newly available textual record to justify the labor-intensive close attention to small numbers of texts without relying so much on selection decisions made generations ago. We know what canonical figures wrote. Their writings form the very basis of our understanding of literature. While we may continue to value deeper inspection and reconsideration of what they have to offer, there is a real need for close engagement with non-canonical texts. The close study, or what I would call the middle distance study of non-canonical texts, allows for the discovery of new voices and perspectives that can challenge our understanding of literary history. I would define middle distance study as a way of examining texts that requires actually reading and editing them, though perhaps not to the excruciating extent that is typically afforded to texts considered cultural treasures. My own editorial project, The Tar Baby and the Tomahawk, Race and Ethnic Images in American Children's Literature, has led me to think about the principles that guide middle distance editorial work. So far, we've collected a couple hundred texts of varying genres and lengths that all demonstrate how racial difference was depicted to American children during a time of great um, of radical social upheaval and the formation of significant public policy. Our project is more clearly thesis-driven than author-centered ar archives and includes a lot of interpretive material 
and it has required us to carefully read the texts, but not usually in an admiring way. One observation um, that has come about from this work is that close-ish textual attention is required to account for literature that lacks what we might call authenticity. One commonality between a close reading of canonical texts and a gross reading of massive databases is that both approaches assume that the texts result from an author sincerely speaking his mind. That is, author-centric editorial projects assume an interest in texts as expressions of a great mind that serves as the organizing principle of the project. Likewise, gross reading methods seem to work best when we can assume that the texts being queried mean what they say, they, that a, a rise in the occurrence of affirmative statements, for example, indicates a rise in intended from affirmative statements. The methods and scope vary, but standard approaches in close reading and gross reading seem to usually assume a direct connection between what was intended and what was written. But working with non-canonical texts has exposed all kinds of cases in which that assumption does not hold. For example, the most extensive record of slave folk tales recorded in the 19th century were published by Joel Chandler Harris, a white Georgian journalist who wrote the tales in I dialect and put them in the mouth of a fictional black narrator, Uncle Remus. These stories would not even provide data to most gross reading methods because the irregular spellings would elude text analysis. So the most comprehensive record of slave tales would probably not even be counted by gross reading methods and would be one of those anomalous texts that we are told come out in the wash. But conventional close reading methods are also ill-suited because the stories are not fully authored by Harris, who is not responsible for their plots, their characters, etc. It requires actually reading these problematic but important stories but not in a celebratory way to make sense of them. Similarly, we've begun working with newspapers, I think I have a picture of one, yeah, um, published by Native American students at Indian boarding schools. These texts were authored, illustrated, and published by Native students, but all under the censoring gaze of schoolmasters who were forcibly trying to assimilate the students into white culture by training them for manual labor. The newspapers provide a record of the students' lives, but a highly sanitized and propagandistic one that requires reading and interpreting these texts. So I want to suggest that digital scholarly editing faces challenges from within, seeming too fixated on an inherited canon or on navel-gazing minutia, and from without, seeming quaint in comparison to big data methodologies. One way we can respond to these challenges is to focus on exploratory projects that retain the long-held values of close-ish textual attention and interest in material history while studying underrepresented texts that are grouped on novel selection criteria. Such an approach promises cultural and textual insights that might otherwise be missed by the microscopic and macroscopic so I'd now like to talk about how I've implemented this kind of work in my digital humanities classes, and I'm happy to talk more about those afterwards, too. So first, some caveats. Um, text encoding, the, the kind of in-depth, uh, student-conceived markup that I teach in my classes is definitely not free of its problems. It is extremely labor-intensive, it's time-consuming, it's very frustrating to beginners. If any of you have learned this, you are well aware. Um, and you require equipment, you know, classroom license of a text, an XML editor, laptops that students can take home. Um, and it's also the, the dominant scholarly methodology for digital editing, TEI, which I'm going to explain in a moment, is far from an uncontroversial way of approaching texts, even in the digital editing community. It's predicated on a theory of textuality that is open to an array of criticisms. <coughs> And anyone who has worked with it for a long time will have a lengthy list of quibbles regarding various features and probably more fundamental complaints about it. I sure have mine. Notwithstanding its practical and theoretical hurdles, digital editing is an invaluable way to teach close textual attention. Um, I thought I might just briefly explain what TEI is here for those of you who don't already know, and I'm assuming that's probably most people. TEI is a vocabulary used in XML encoding. 
XML's extensible markup language. Like its more familiar relative, HTML, XML uses tags, so that's the descriptors in the single brackets, to label portions of text or points in the text. So this is how you would tag a paragraph. The first P you know, is the beginning of a paragraph. The slash P is the end of a paragraph. Um, and the P means paragraph in HTML. Browsers know how to interpret that tag, and then they visually display it according to how they're programmed to do so. HTML and XML are both based on a model of textuality called OHCO, Ordered Hierarchy Content Objects, which just rolls off the tongue. <laughs> um, OHCO is not itself any particular technology or language. It's actually an abstract way of thinking about text that is then realized through XML and through HTML. And OHCO essentially holds that text is composed of objects with content, like a word or a sentence or a paragraph that um, must occur in a certain order. You can't move those around without consequences to the meaning of the text and that have a hierarchical relationship to each other so that a book contains chapters that contain paragraphs that contain sen sentences and words. XML and HTML then implement this view of textuality that OHCO puts forth. So if you take a look at this extremely simplified, ah, lost my place, there we go, XML encoding, can you guys see that? Probably too tiny. I'm losing my spot, but it's okay. Um, so this says book, right? And it closes here, and it contains a title, and it contains two chapters that then have their own content. I ask my students to think of this as dividing the text up into Tupperware containers so that the largest container is the book with um, its own lid you know, at the end, and then it holds two medium-sized ones that hold the smaller ones on down. If we wanted to encode this book in HTML, we would use the text provided by that language, probably body for the book, div for the chapters, etc. And any browser would be able to read those tags and translate them into a display that we can see on our computer. But the crucial difference between HTML and XML is that XML does not provide any terms. So um, unlike HTML that tells you what to call a paragraph, XML doesn't tell you what to call anything. It leaves it wide open to a community of users to determine their own terminology to describe things that are of interest to them. I'm glossing over this a little. So TEI was a community, or is a community, of uh, humanists in um, different institutions internationally who over the years have agreed upon a set of terms. I think we're up to um, 600 maybe, um, last time I bothered to ask about this, um, that have agreed upon meanings and are implemented in agreed upon situations to describe text. Okay, but XML, unlike HTML, cannot be read automatically by browsers, which stands to reason because you're making up your own terms. So how would your browser know right, how to interpret those? So um, XML and TEI requires the use of a style sheet, which is a file written in XSLT, um, much more challenging than XML, to translate the XML into displayable HTML. TEI is frequently used in large text, pro text projects to provide metadata and markup that is not much more complex than the basic structural tags one might find in HTML. Using in-depth markup is very time consuming, and the more complex and specific the encoding is, the less likely it is to apply to large numbers of heterogeneous texts. So many smaller boutique projects use much more specialized descriptive TEI markup. Often, such XML files include more markup than text, as projects layer claims about formal structure, variants, historical content, and other topics of interest. 
So when I teach classes on digital editing, I address TEI XML, XSLT, and then also basic HTML and CSS. Students select historical literary materials, typically from um, our library special collections. They scan them. They develop an editorial methodology informed by a theory that we read in class. They decide upon what TEI tags best accommodate that editorial methodology. They encode the texts in TEI. They write the XSLT that harvests desirable data from the texts and translates them into HTML. And then they style it with some CSS to make it look pretty, if they have time. And then finally, they write introductory editorial materials to explain their editing um, to, to readers. And I did not talk about that. Okay. So many practitioners of TEI, including me, disagree with OHCO, at least to some extent, and can find some of its attendant technological limitations very frustrating. However, it offers a rigorous, systematic, and somewhat flexible way for students to inscribe a view of the text onto the text itself. TEI offers a refreshing alternative to writing a term paper, which for all of its value, nonetheless often tempts students to cherry pick textual evidence and wait until the last minute, circumventing the goals of extended, thoughtful engagement with the text. But to properly encode a text in TEI in a digital editing course, students must first read the text in order to determine what features are of interest. Some of these are bound to be formal and would probably include noting the basic structural features of the work. From there, they can develop any number of interests in the text, including continued study of the formal properties, or more content-based interests, such as tracing the gender of speakers, the tribal identity of characters, the locations of places mentioned in the text, etc. The students working in groups usually agree on a focus that they wish to bring to the text and then write a rationale explaining why that's important and what kind of critical lens informs it, and then um, a justification for the tag set that they have chosen to implement that view of the text. They divide the text up, encode their portions, speaking to each other frequently throughout, um, and then trade them for quality control. This entire process requires each student to read and reread the text for any of the features that weren't encoding based on their criteria. And during this work, they frequently encounter conflicts in the text when it fails to conform to their prescriptions. And I think those are some of the best um, educational moments. Perhaps the meter is irregular or gender is uncertain or the author uses racist or outmoded terms to describe tribal identity, or places in the text are imprecise or fictitious. They are forced to account for these disruptions by adjusting their description of the text, all of which enriches their understanding and pushes them to think about textual difficulties or inconsistencies that could be easily skirted in a brief analytical essay. I teach a class called Digital Archives and Editions, I had my syllabus online. Um, at the University of Nebraska. And it combines graduate and undergraduate students, most but not all of whom have no previous experience with XML when they enter the class. I think it's pretty remarkable to see how they develop over the semester as they feel motivated to master the technology to communicate their view of the text and then when the technology drives them deeper into the words to develop even richer views of the text. So for example, I just pulled one up from a couple of years ago now. Um, three students in one of my recent classes found this 19th century book on beekeeping, The Hive and the Honey Bee, which turns out is the seminal text in beekeeping. And um, on this group, uh, of three students, one of them had previously worked as a beekeeper, one had a degree in theology, and one was a practicing poet. And so they were drawn to this book for its historical significance at a time when the fate of bees is very much in question. So the student with the, tech, the theology background was interested in how bees and beekeeping have been historically used as religious metaphors within the church. Um, and how the author, who was himself a clergyman, drew on those metaphors to explain the science. 
the poet was intrigued by how this book, which is his, you know, um, a scientific uh, treatise, nevertheless dra draws constantly on literary allusions and snippets of poetry throughout. And the beekeeper appreciated it as a foundational text for her profession. So the group decided to bring these different perspectives to bear on this work. So they typed out by hand all 384 pages of the book, and they encoded structural features throughout. And as they went, they layered in three systems of notes, one from the perspective of a beekeeper, one from a theologian, and one from a poet. And they enriched this book with about 400 notes that were woven into the text, annotating everything from references to Shakespeare to details about bee subspecies. And I'll just pull up their XML, which is messy, but you get a better sense of all of the stuff that they put into it here. They have all of their many notes down here. So sometimes, in public, discussions of digital humanities gets conflated with distant reading, which prompts teeth gnashing about digital humanities heralding the death of close reading mm -hmm. and textual primacy. One recent example of this was Stanley Fish's piece in the Opinionator, um, part of the New York Times, in which he describes digital humanities as seeking to digitize the entire corpus so you can put questions to it and get answers in a matter of seconds. Fish and several commenting readers seemed intent on pitting digital and traditional humanities against each other. One reader responded that digital humanities is duping students with sub-literacy, and another, no kidding, claimed that we are going to finish off civilization as well. <laughs> um, on the contrary, one of the oldest strains of digital humanities, text encoding, is really fundamentally an exercise in close reading. I have never actually seen the duped youth in my charge exhibit as much careful attention to textual detail as they do when they have been asked to create a digital edition of a text. Several years ago at the University of Georgia, one of my undergraduates completed his first text encoding assignment, and I thought he said quite eloquently that he was surprised to find that it was really an extended meditation upon the poem. I also wanted to just briefly um, note, if I can go back to my slides. And I'll go over this quickly because I'm looking short on time, but um, one of the other values that I personally find in teaching digital editing is the sense of discovery and empower empowerment that it foregrounds in a literature classroom. In my experience, students have been taught to think about literature as abstract and immaterial. If they have read Leaves of Grass or Dickinson's poems, they think of them as sequences of words, but they've never typically considered the material history of those words. And I think that that's related to the phenomenon of thinking of the canon as fixed and inherited. A, a lot of undergraduate students are aware that um, the mid to late 20th century involved a lot of shakeups within the canon, but they seem to think that that work has now been done and that what you read when you read literature is something that is decided by other people at another time and another place. And I have found that digital editing offers an opportunity to foreground material histories of texts while inviting students to what I call in, in my classes um, engage cultural spelunking, right? So that you, your job in class is to go into a messy, um, largely unfiltered textual record in order to try to make sense of it and to find things that are potentially revelatory or of interest. And by working through that, students are invited to think about texts as things that are actually produced by real humans with their own biases and goals and who are working within very specific material and socio-political contexts. And it leads them to think that literature as a discipline is constantly evolving um, even as they're working on their projects. So I'm going to skip over a few of these things when we talk about NQA. I 
just to conclude, find that digital editing is really kind of a return to some pedagogical values that used to be really central to literary studies, um, the kind of material research, discovery, and contribution that was part of bibliographic methods from, from earlier in the 20th century. And um, as I was doing the work on this paper, I ran across a quote by Stephen Ambrose, who said that he was drawn to the study of history, his, his discipline, because he said, it hit me like a sledgehammer it had never before occurred to me that I could add to the sum of the world's knowledge. And it was an assignment that asked him to kind of dive into the historical record and write on a long neglected figure that made him suddenly see the discipline as something he could actively participate in instead of passively study. So that's all I had to say in my talk. <laughs> Since I went off script, it didn't have a nice conclusive sound at the end of it. <laughs> open, open it up to your questions. They would typically, I think, have, um, I'm not 100% sure what their bar is, but they would probably want it to have a publisher or something besides being in a class project to kind of get into the catalog. Um, but I think that once students have edited something like this and it goes up online, it's at least findable. You know, they can come back to it later. Uh, one student who um, began a group project about three years ago in a class for me is now, um, running with it. Um, he has a, a um, position in our new digital communities incubator for grad students, and so he's kind of really made it his own and is transforming it and so that it can be something akin to a, a publication, you know, that he can show later. Um, how libraries deal with these, I don't know. I mean, that's, um, that's beyond my um, sphere in a lot of ways, <laughs> but I know that it gets, I can know that it gets messy. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it just seems somewhat, I don't know, temporal is the right word yeah. for it, mm -hmm. but you know, do they become part of that, that curated body of work that enters enters our, our yeah. libraries themselves? Or are they intended to be somewhat somewhat temporary, I guess? Yeah, I um, I think that's a really good question. And I guess I'm I'm not a librarian, so maybe I have different a different sense of this, but I have learned to embrace um, <clears throat> the ephemeral nature of digital work in a lot of ways. Um, I, there are certainly digital stuff out there that is <clears throat> pretty stable, you know, um, digitized journals and Google books and things like that can be easily found and they're probably not going to disappear unless there's a zombie apocalypse or something like that. But um, I think that when you're dealing with kind of, kind of finite, limited projects like student work, 
these are as enduring or more enduring as would be any seminar paper or you know, something else that they would produce and potentially much more so. But yeah, I think it's, it's an open and unresolved question. I mean, sometimes once students suddenly realize that this work is asking them to do that, they get, go overboard with it. <laughs> so they want to know, I, I, let me find a better image that shows up a little better on the screen, but um, well, for example, they might be really interested in the fact that this has block justified in exactly where the line breaks are, even though it's prose, which is something I would not advise them to waste time on, right? Or they might, um, <laughs> or they get, oh, they wanna know exactly how, they wanna distinguish the length of the different dashes that occur in the, you know, so they get, it's suddenly overwhelming, and um, in some ways I don't really want to tell them not to do that, but I do for the sake of everyone's sanity. <laughs> um, but I, I think that they um, also sometimes can notice things that I would never have thought of, that they kind of bring the wisdom of a beginner, you know, to, to bear on texts that I would have just viewed in ways that I've been trained to view. And I, I had a student also in a, a class several years ago now, and we were debating how to treat a book's spine, which is one of the many kind of frustrations with TEI is that they don't really have a specific way of dealing with the spine of the book. They have front and back. And she said, it's the front because it is the front to most people when it's on the bookcase. You know? And I thought that was a kind of cool <laughs> student observation that you know, I, I wouldn't have ever thought of. But yeah, so it can, it, it's, it's a neat, and I, I tend to think of those kinds of conversations as more productive for the journey than the result, you know, that it's, um, and in the space of one semester, it's seldom that a group of students can really polish a project. There's just not enough time. Um, they they um, sometimes say that they wish the, center, the class was two semesters long so that they would have time to then tighten all the display and the different neat things that you can do with these materials once you've invested the labor in that encoding. But I've learned to just kind of embrace it for what it is, which is, you know, a semester of kind of playing with texts in, in that way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is really it's, it's exciting to me and really interesting. I tried to do um, a similar project but from a different direction with, um, I had a Toni Morrison class, and I tried to get them to envision the text, do close readings and envision the text in visual ways, and then how they would represent them on Second Life. Mm -hmm. um, and I had several builders, and so um, it was a really neat project. It worked in really interesting ways the first semester. But I came across, um, when I tried to replicate it, there were several students in the, the ensuing years, um, well, we ran into lots of different problems, but they, um, they were very resistant mm -hmm. to, um, to the technology, right? Oh, okay. um, so they, um, they just wanted to read the text, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I wonder if this might have been a better way kind of going, um, kind of having that step in between of having a text and then translating it in some ways. Right into a different form of text before moving into those kind of visual right. aspects of it. But a lot of them, um, I, I expected them to be more savvy with the materials and the, um, and the technology than I was, and they were not, which was really surprising to me. Yeah, and you know, that's a really good point, is one of the things um, that I have discovered over the last too many years, um, since I, I think I, I taught a um, class that addressed digital issues back in, as a TA in 2001 or 2002. And back then, I had more students in classes that knew how to encode than I do now. And I would not have expected that, but I think that what has happened is that at that time period, 
um, the web was still new enough and um, you could break it open and see the moving pieces so much easier that motivated people that were just a little geeky, right? Like knew how to do stuff and were willing to jump in and do it. And now it's become more of this kind of um, opaque system, like the way that I don't know how my television works, right? And so it's the, I, I think that, um, I, feel, I feel this is a little unfortunate, but I think, and I'm generalizing that a lot of students um, have become more passive consumers of technology. And so it may be like kind of weird to, to ask them to jump in and do those things. And in the classes that I've taught, they're so specifically about doing these things that you can just kind of I'll tell them to suck it up because that's what they signed on for. You know? <laughs> but I can see that if it was a kind of part of a more traditional literature class, it kind of comes out of nowhere and is a little disorienting or something. Yeah, that sounds, that's a neat project. I was wondering if there's some other new, um, technological platform that would they would be more comfortable with um, and I'm not I'm not sure yeah yeah I'm going to ask you about your use of the term <coughs> gross uh, mm -hmm. and first of all whether it's your term I'm not it's not my term okay. although I'm not going to remember who okay. will find it now <laughs> but, but you know the, the same in contrast with distant mm -hmm. meaning mm -hmm. um, Mariah's term and, and it seems to me that you are coming from a very material book history mm -hmm. angle, right, of DH in terms of literary studies, and that there's this other side that, right. I won't call it immaterial, but that very use of the term distance, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, makes us think more of the ether than of the spine of the book. Right. Um, and so I, I wonder what role editing plays, digital editing plays in the DH world then. Mm -hmm. are, are those more um, distance reading um, focused DHers dismissive of digital editing I think or overlook it as even part of the digital humanity? Yeah, and then, yeah, that's a really good question. And um, I think, yes, the answer is they are dismissive of it. And really, it, to me, very, it's very similar to the kind of way that theory made editing look like paraprofessional work um, a few decades ago, right? That um, digital editorial projects were some of the first web-based DH um, projects to come out, you know, mostly out of um, the Institute for Advanced Technology and the Humanities at the University of Virginia in the mid to late 90s. And so there was Rossetti, Blake, Whitman, The Valley of the Shadow, right? They were all coming out of there and they were all um, really centrally about, um, well, especially the literary ones, textual or artifact representation. And um, that has come to be seen as old fashioned and kind of frumpy, I think. And, the, and I'm not speaking for, I don't, I don't wanna paint with too broad of a brush, but I think that that is the kind of view in a incredibly expansive definition of digital humanities that I have seen in the last few years seeming to place more and more of a premium on the new, that the, that the kind of um, ethos, um, Andy, Jewel, and I wrote about this once and called it um, a, a hipster ethos in digital humanities where what is new, what's, what's new and what is cool is what is often valued over kind of more established, less flashier, technological methods because you know HTML and XML are not by any means um, cutting edge you know technologies they're still cutting edge to students who have typically never engaged with them <laughs> um, but they are I think really great at accommodating solid humanities based questions in the classroom but yeah so I mean I guess maybe I'm a little defensive of digital editing because I think it gets kind of a bad rap and right as it was sort of what um, defined digital humanities and was doing so much for the humanities and now, you know, it's kind of uh, maybe a little on the, the less cool side of, of what people are doing. Yeah. It's just ironic when you have so much of a very conservative discipline, methodolo methodologically conservative discipline, resistant to DH right. in all its forms, mm -hmm. um, that you would have a DH community. Right, dismissive of. That's right. 
yeah, you could you could see digital editing kind of getting it from both sides. <laughs> yes, yeah, right, right. that's right. Yeah. So this is just a response to that. Uh, my thought is, uh, it seems as though what you, the way you nicely situated um, gross or disagreeing on one hand and close on the other, um, suggested to me that really, as you describe them, they're 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 at least functionally doing the same thing. Right, like the, so, you described distant or gross reading as um, uh, better living through data analysis. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's a sort of sequential, almost algorithmic quality mm -hmm. to these kinds yeah. of these forms of study. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it isn't a, isn't like strong close reading of the sort that many of us read in you know English classes. Precisely the same kind of sequential yeah. thing, right? Like when you think about a strong Marxist reading of a text. It is algorithmic to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. Now, those things may be different ontologically, but certainly at a functional level, they're the same. And it strikes me that what you're describing here, this kind of medium data, mm -hmm. this like middle ground in and through digital editing, seems to be a kind. It seems to pose the perfect kind of rapprochement between those two mm -hmm. things, right? Because what is editing but a sequential process by which right. one um, arrives at whatever one arrives at when one edits. Yeah, I think you put that very nicely. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, I think that you're you're right about them both being essentially algorithmic. And I mean, that, I'm I'm wondering if that isn't what we all do when we're interpreting or analyzing texts. You know, um, it, it it is a matter of of kind of where the frame is. You know, are we looking at um, a sonnet or Thirty thousand books, or something in the wide, you know, um, kind of uh, disparity in between those. And yeah, I mean, that's to me what has been most interesting about this work is the the, the middle distance, where you're still reading the texts as texts, but not kind of um, microscopically so necessarily. Although I do that too. Um, but yeah, I think I think that that's 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 right. That it's the kind of um, sweet spot where you're kind of able to get the the insight from both kind of stances. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Doesn't that put editors in a fantastic position? You would think so. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think so. <laughs> I think it's really I think it's really fascinating and promising work. But it does have you know. Um, Editing sounds boring to everyone, right? And it is, it doesn't have quite the um, cool, seductive powers of um, a lot of other DH methods, you know? Um, and it doesn't kind of, you don't feel extremely powerful after having edited something in TEI, quite the opposite, right? But when I watch some people who do text mining, it's like, well, look, you can just play with these vast numbers, and it's really awesome. And TEI is the opposite. You show somebody a web page you created, they're like, OK, that's a web page. But you don't know, you don't know what went into all the, <laughs> the data that went into that display. Um, so I mean, I think it, it's, there are all kinds of reasons why um, why maybe editing is not in a great position. And going back to your observation, Laura, I think it's because it still looks like the threat of digital humanities to people who are really kind of conservative in their approaches, and it looks like stodgy old school stuff to people who are really radical in their TH approaches. And so um, I, have, I feel like it is diminishing um, institutionally anyway over the past you know, decade or so, but um, who knows what the future will hold. Question yeah. about the future of your of your work. Um, it's a general open question. Where do you see digital editing going in, in the next five, ten years? Yeah, that's a good question. I um I think that there are some different exciting possible areas where it might go. One is that I think there are some real possibilities in semantic web technology. Um, which in a nutshell, you know, would allow you to describe textual features, make claims about them that could then um, be yoked 
to other texts and claims about them, so that you're still doing kind of um, close reading and making interpretive claims, but in a kind of technologically different way that would tether them together with other texts and allow you to draw inferences and patterns about the kinds of observations that you're making. Um, I also, despite maybe sounding too hard on um, kind of distance reading methods, I think that what might emerge are cool combinations of these methods that a lot of people are kind of cloistered in how they're doing this work right now, that they're focusing on one to the exclusion of the other, and that we might see um, really neat ways that they can work in tandem, especially with the kind of semantic web stuff, maybe as the glue that would, that would allow that to happen. about um, the, the classroom and do these digital ed digital editing projects encourage students to collaborate or do you ask them to collaborate? Yeah, they have to. They mm -hmm. have to collaborate. Yeah, they have to work in groups and um, that is almost always successful. <laughs> Not always, but um, I, I don't think it's possible to really do this work on your own um, unless it's a, a very limited um, kind of project, and I think collaboration is intellectually useful because they have to kind of be consistent um, in reading each other's portions of the text, you know, it, it, the, the kind of act of ensuring quality control is intellectually fruitful to students, but I also think that it gives them a more accurate taste of what this work is in the real world, like if they were to work at a digital center or pursue DH as a kind of, um, area of study long term. So I think that it has to be collaborative, but I try to limit it to groups of typically three or four students so that they can reasonably work with each other. What, what kinds of uh, issues come up in these collaborations for the students? Can you provide an example? Or yeah, well, I mean, there's the age old, somebody's not doing what they're supposed to do problem, <laughs> which can cause it to implode. Um, <laughs> also, sometimes um, students are drawn to particular things over others. So XSLT, which I didn't talk about at great length here, is, is really pretty difficult, especially when you're tacking it on right after they just kind of figured out how to do TEI and now they have to learn XSLT. So there are some students who think that their forte is not in this close reading stuff and they want to take on the XSLT because then they can style it and they don't have to really um, make the tough decisions that the, that the people doing the encoding are. And then there are students who are kind of still squeamish about the tech part and they want to divide up the work so that all they have to do is proofread or those kinds of things. So I have to sometimes get into the groups and make sure that they're all doing all of it or that they're dividing it up in a way that they're kind of, the project is requiring them to do all the stuff that we're learning in class. So there's some division of labor issues that, are, that also imitate, you know, um, the problems of digital editing in, on a professional level. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, you mentioned the uh, ordered hierarchy content objects in XML. I was just wondering if, if you had all, all you, know, you said you weren't totally um, uh, behind that. Are there alternative technologies or alternative things that can be used in digital editing? Um, yeah, I think maybe to answer that, um, it requires defining editing, which gets kind of philosophical quickly, you know. Um, certainly there are other ways that people represent texts. Um, I think that the very nature of the web, though, makes OHCO hard to escape because, um, it is so integrated with, um, you know, HTML and the kind of foundational structures of the web, where we view things as pages that you know then have content in them. That um, it remains like the massively dominant way that texts are approached. And I think that if you if you wanted to undertake a grant funded editorial project, it would be um, you'd have to really make a case for why you're not representing the text in that way. Partially because um, TEI, TEI has been under development for over 20 years, and um, it has 
a long history of smart thinking and implementation behind it, and it was always kind of meant to, if not allow interoperability, which is never going to happen because the t projects are so um, kind of idiosyncratic in how they encode text, you can't simply like just join them up in productive ways without massaging the data somewhat. But it allow it at least is a kind of common language for people to go from one project to the other so that you can really have a community of text editing where you know um, how somebody else is generally going to be approaching the text or you can make good guesses at it. So I, mean, I think that there are good reasons why TEI um, remains dominant and is a you know, powerful and effective way of, of treating text digitally. Um, I think that there are some downsides to that too. Uh, but um, I'm trying to think of, off the top of my head of great um, alternatives and they all ones that are kind of substantial projects that I know of seem to be based on, on that on that kind of view of the text. Yeah. Any more questions? Thank you very much. Thank you.